join us on Patreon, and become part of our journey to uncover history's untold stories. Your support helps us create in-depth content, bring hidden narratives to life, and keep history alive for everyone. He came out of the Gulf of Guinea carrying more than a medical bag, languages, poems, a patient political imagination, and a restless determination to refuse the quiet that colonial rule expected of talented men from the margins. Rafael Ernest Grail Armado is the sort of historical figure who slips between genres, part physician, part anthropologist, part poet, part agitator, and whose life reads like a novel until you remind yourself that every oddity and every claim left behind can be traced in newspapers, hospital reports, speeches, and the brittle paper of mid-century journals. He was born in 1913 in Kita on the Gold Coast, trained in Europe, and returned to West Africa with a claim that reads like both miracle and modest public health intervention, a locally developed remedy called the bochi that he said could treat a range of parasitic and waterborne ailments. He was also a public voice for the U people in Togoland on the international stage, a man who took his case to the United Nations, and whose sudden death in Hamburg in December 1953 left friends and enemies asking whether the end of his story was as tidy as the governments and newspapers wanted it to be. Rafael Armado's early life was shaped by the particular distortions of the colonial map. Born to a new family in an era when the old German protectorates had been sliced by imperial negotiation into British and French spheres, Armado learned not only the languages of the colonizers, English, French, and German, but also the local tongues and the habits of commerce. He studied at Mfansipim in Cape Coast, and then left for Europe as a young man to pursue further education. In Germany, and later at the Sorbonne in Paris, he studied medicine, anthropology, and literature. In Edinburgh, he qualified in medicine, and then worked as a physician in Northern Ireland. It was in the strange, liminal spaces of these European cities, Derry among them, where he developed the kind of cosmopolitan patina that would make some call him the Irishman from West Africa, and others, with a mixture of affection and bemusement, an African Paracelsus. The narrative of a single invention, the cure that makes a life into legend, tempts us into neat moral arcs, but Armado's story resists such tidiness. The remedy often called a bochi is the centerpiece of his medical reputation, but the best way to understand its significance is to think of it as a product of mid-century experiments in tropical medicine, ethnobotany, and the politics of scarcity. In West Africa of the 1930s and 1940s, colonial medical services were overwhelmed by endemic parasitic diseases, schistosomiasis, hookworm, guinea worm, and a host of fungal infections, and access to pharmaceuticals was limited by cost, imperial procurement priorities, and the relative neglect of rural communities. Physicians trained in Europe sometimes attempted to bridge that gap by translating traditional remedies into standardized formulations, or by developing inexpensive, locally manufacturable compounds. Armado presented a bochi as such an intervention, a preparation with demonstrable effectiveness against parasites and other afflictions that tended to travel with poverty and contaminated water. Contemporary press accounts and later reminiscences attribute to him not only a clinical intuition, but the political instinct to make medicine available beyond the comfortable clinics of colonial capitals. Those who met him in clinic and lecture halls spoke of a charismatic, somewhat theatrical practitioner. He could pass from a colloquium on anthropology to a crowded medical tent without missing cadence. He wrote poetry that collected the particular cadences of oratory and the melancholy of migration, and he argued vehemently against the way colonial and early post-colonial administrations parceled up African identities. For Armado, the division of Togoland and the separation of you peoples across new borders were not mere academic puzzles, but wounds to be named and addressed. He took that cause to the world stage, and in 1953, he addressed the United Nations, pleading for the unification of British and French Togoland, a demonstration of the way his scientific and political imaginaries were braided. He believed that public health and political sovereignty were parts of the same struggle, that disease and displacement were twin expressions of a broader dispossession. The Abochi preparation, like many medicines conceived at the intersection of laboratory work and folk practice, was controversial because it challenged who owned knowledge and who controlled access. Armado chose not to keep his findings entirely within the closed circles of European research institutes. At different moments, he published, 
lectured and sought recognition. At other moments, he was harshly critical of governments who he believed tried to mystify or cheapen his work. Some accounts say the patent for Obochi was later bought by a Nigerian company and marketed as a profitable commodity. Others suggest that the remedy's dissemination was uneven and that Armado had to fight to have his work recognized on its own terms rather than absorbed into the corporate medicine of the post-war world. Precisely because medicines are both science and commodity, annals of such histories reveal how often the person who knows the cure bears the brunt of its politics. One frequently repeated claim about Armado is that he was nominated for or associated with a Nobel distinction. The historical record is specific. He was nominated for the 1948 Nobel Peace Prize, an honor that reflects his public profile as much as any pharmacological achievement. This nomination, which appears in archival mentions and regional biographies, shows how unusual a figure he was. Not simply a country doctor, but a man whose activities crossed medicine, diplomacy, and literature. While the Nobel nomination did not translate into the kind of institutional backing that ensures a medical innovation scale up, it did put Armado's name on a global ledger and made him a representative figure of African intellectual ambitions in the immediate post-war decade. Politics is rarely a neutral background to invention. In the Gold Coast of the 1940s and early 1950s, as decolonization accelerated, allegiances within emerging nationalist movements were fragile and intense. Armado's position on the future of Togoland, that you people should be united rather than partitioned, put him at odds with leaders, notably Kwame Krumah, who had their own political programs for the region. Accounts from contemporaries imply that these disagreements sometimes spilled into personal animus. There are narratives that suggest Armado was attacked by supporters of political rivals, that his obstinacy in negotiating with emerging governments cost him friends, and that his insistence on respect and proper recognition was interpreted as intransigence. It is in these fraught intersections of science, commerce, and politics that the darker rumors about his death take shape. On a cold December day in 1953, Armado fell ill in Hamburg, where he was seeking to pursue research and to extend his international work. He died in hospital on 21 or December 22, 1953. The exact phrasing varies slightly among sources. After his death, his wife reported that he had told her he believed he had been poisoned. That allegation, a private claim with public resonance, has been repeated in later accounts and oral histories and sits uneasily between plausible suspicion and the sort of conspiracy that thrives when a brilliant outsider dies far from home. The contemporary press and subsequent biographies have recorded both the official medical accounts of his death and the objections raised by his family and some colleagues. Whether the cause was malicious poisoning, an undetected infection, or another medical complication, the fact that his end was sudden and abroad ensured his name would be wrapped in speculation and elegy. If one reads the minute by minute of the archival traces, Letters, newspaper clippings, blue plaque announcements, and later tributes, a pattern emerges. Armado was never comfortably reconcilable with the institutions he critiqued, and yet nor did he fully belong to any counter-institutional network that could have protected or amplified his findings in a sustained, institutional way. His mix of rhetorical flamboyance, suspicion of centralized authority, and insistence on credit-complicated alliances. When a remedy like a bochi sits between laboratory validation, patent law, and the politics of newly independent African states, the person who developed it is vulnerable to the vagaries of recognition. Where there is no strong institutional custodian for a discovery, it is easy for claims to be diluted, repackaged, or claimed by others, and it is correspondingly easy for a person's life to be turned into an emblem rather than a record of ordinary scholarly labor. Beyond the headlines about Obochi and the whisperings about his death, Armado left a literary trail. He wrote poetry, Between the Forest and the Sea, and the posthumously published Deep Down in the Black Man's Mind, and essays that reveal a reflective mind probing the paradoxes of hybridity. His writings contain a patience with paradox, the doctor who argued for scientific rigor and yet also drew from vernacular knowledge, the patriot who believed in pan-African solidarity and yet insisted on the linguistic and cultural specificity of the U. This literary output complicates any attempt to reduce him to a single story of triumph or tragedy, 
It gives texture to his image as a man trying to hold multiple worlds together, even as those worlds kept pressing in different directions. How did history treat someone like Armado? For decades, his name appeared in regional biographies, local commemorations, and scattered newspaper pieces, but he did not become a dominant figure in standard histories of African science or the decolonization canon. Several forces converge in explaining that neglect. First, the institutional pathways that transform individual discoveries into mainstream medicine, clinical trials, regulatory approvals, multinational manufacturing and distribution were, in the mid-20th century, heavily centered in Europe and North America. A remedy developed in the margins, without large institutional backers, could be clinically useful yet fail to enter global pharmacopoeias. Second, the post-independence political settlement in many African countries privileged certain narratives of nationhood, figures who did not align easily with dominant parties or who remained politically independent often found their reputation sidelined. Finally, their archival record itself, letters, lab notes, patent documents, can be lost, scattered, or never produced in bureaucratic form, leaving historians with tantalizing references but not always the documentary mass they need to write definitive accounts. To write a modern history of Armado is therefore to perform two tasks at once, to assemble the known facts and to be honest about the gaps. We can document his birth and education, we can point to contemporaneous claims about Obochi and the later reports the Nigerian firm purchased a patent, we can place him at the United Nations and trace his political interventions. We can also acknowledge what historians sometimes must, that some aspects of a life, the moment of death, the precise formula of a remedy, the private conversations that shape public decisions, remain obfuscated by time, competing narratives, and the loss of simple documentary proof. That uncertainty is not a weakness of history, but its texture. It pushes the present to ask not only what happened, but why do we remember some people in certain ways and let others fall into the margins? Armado's story is also a cautionary tale about the politics of recognition and science. It shows how discovery is rarely a solitary, linear event. It is embedded in systems of funding, translation, credibility, and distribution. When medicine is bound to the fortunes of states and corporations, a remedy's fate can be decided as much by who markets it as by who invented it. The dynamic has repeated in many forms across history, but it hits with particular force in post-colonial contexts where the local knowledge and the local inventor are often the first to be effaced. Remembering our motto, then, is not merely an act of memorialization for its own sake. It is an intervention in the broader history of how scientific knowledge from the global South has been treated, packaged, and oftentimes appropriated. In the end, Raphael Armato resists the constraining categories that tidy biographical museums impose. He was an inventor and a poet, a critic of empire and a practitioner of medicine, an international presence and a local exile. His death in Hamburg leaves a melancholic coda, whether caused by poison, illness, or the cruel arithmetic of travel in the 1950s. It cuts short a life that would have otherwise continued to negotiate the uneasy choreography of decolonization. Yet his memory persists in plaques, in scattered essays, in the memories of patients, and in the stubborn retelling of his remedies and speeches. That persistence matters because it reminds us that the history of science is not only the history of labs and patents, but also the history of persons who insisted that science be made in the service of communities, who carried their cultural knowledge into laboratory rooms, and who refuse to be merely footnotes in histories written by others. If we are to take away anything from Armado's life, it is this, the archive is partial, and humans are both more and less coherent than the archival record allows. To honor his work is to keep interrogating those partial records, to look for lab notebooks in unexpected basements, to listen to family stories as evidence of practice, and to think critically about how scientific recognition is assigned. It is to accept that some cures are not singular miracles but networks of knowledge, and that the disappearance that haunts some stories can be less a literal vanishing than a failure of institutions to remember, and thus to make whole the lives of those who labored at the edges. Armado's life invites us to a more generous, less triumphalist history of medicine, one that sees invention as collective, remembers the multilingual itineraries of its makers, and keeps asking the old, necessary question about who benefits from knowledge and who gets to be recorded for posterity.